This is Wilson Morales from Black Moon TV talking to the filmmakers Trayvon and Martin regarding their film BSI, which is playing at the Tribeca Film Festival, and then they will play later on on HBO. Hello, folks. How's it going? Hey, you're on mute, Trayvon. Good, good. <laughs> How are you? Thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, so I'm sure, obviously, since, you know, the Oscars, you've been pitched a lot of stuff and, you know, you have to decide, you know, documentaries are never easy. You know, you got to take time, research and all of that stuff. How did this project come about? Actually, through one of Martin's friends, um, after we saw the whole fiasco unfold on, uh, in real time with everybody else. Um, did you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's funny. We were watching... When when people started tweeting about it, and it became a thing. You had to like turn it on and see what was happening. And uh, I think I tweeted, uh, funny enough, whoever directs this movie, they should call it BS High. <laughs> and then uh, you know, here we are. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Martin Martin could tell you about his. Uh... Yeah. So my background is uh, before Trayvon and I became a team. I did a lot of sports documentaries. I worked on the Kobe documentary. Um, I worked on Tom versus Time, Tom Brady, Tom Brady show at Facebook, and um, yeah, so that's sort of a thing. And and uh, yeah, Trayvon, I remember Trayvon tweeted, yeah, uh, whoever directs it should call it BSI, and we were just swapping memes on the day. And then a few weeks later, a friend of mine called me and was like, "We've got the guy, we've got him. He said he wants to do a documentary." And we were like, "No way!" Like the dude that set this all up wants to talk because he what? <laughs> and so we we met with him and talked to him, and he was such an incredible character. That we couldn't turn it down. Incredible he is, you know, uh, the gall, you know, the the hubris, you know, the <laughs> watching, you know, is that watching him like, like you would think he was Teflon, you know, like, <laughs> like it's like, does he not have a lawyer near him? Like, is he is he good with saying all of this stuff on camera? You know, are there, are there no laws being broken? Like, he just got away with murder, <laughs> you right. know, and so. There's, you know, obviously, you know, you, there's a certain angle that you're shooting. You're getting the perspectives of players and his take on it. Um, how long did it take to do the research, even though you had him? Yeah, we were, we we researched ahead of shooting of the interviews, but we were also doing it in real time, like right. based off things he was telling us and things we were finding out from other people where it was a very, we had a, a nice team of very talented researchers and journalists um Mary pa Mary Palan who used to work at the Times uh New York Times um uh anchor anchor from the athletic yeah from the athletic yeah we had we had a lot of people working really hard to keep up with the information the facts the the lies the all the things that were were flowing because the story was when we started it was still pretty close to when it actually happened so you're trying to really like get people to divulge the truth about things that they don't have a lot of distance from at the time. And it, it, it takes a little coaxing out to get it out of people sometimes um, at that particular point in time. But yeah, we were, we were definitely like researching in real time on top of the background we'd already done leading up to it because you just didn't know what people were going to say. And we were so surprised by the stuff we found. So that made it even more challenging. Now you you mentioned real time, and that leads me to think that like, was there a game plan? You knew you had him. You had the initial story or what you set out to make, but since you just said you didn't know where things were gonna go, and that's the thing about doing a documentary, what you start off with may change towards the end. You know, at what point did you know what angle you wanted to focus in before you started doing editing, Martin? Sure. Um, I mean, we had one phone conversation with him where um, before it all started, where we were sort of trying to decide if we were going to take the story. And um, he was sitting in his car and he was holding his phone up sort of above his head to make the angle as good as, as, as you know, as good as possible. He had sunglasses on and he parked the car. So the sun was like coming straight in through the window. So it kind of flared um, and uh, kept pulling his sunglasses on and off and telling us the craziest stories that we were like, I remember him telling a story that made it into the film where he's like, um, talking about like, you know, they never paid any of their hotel bills or any of their accommodation bills. In the entire four years, the school was in, uh, it was in operation every year that they would, uh, they would rent some housing for three months and or some hotel rooms and they would just never pay the bill and then get kicked out. He was telling this story like it was a joke. <laughs> he was telling it. He's like, he's like, I mean, look, I was signing up for it 
And they they asked me, did I want to pay now or did I want to pay in three months? So I took the credit. I did what any American did. And we're like, listen to this guy. And we're like, is this, does he realize he's admitting to a crime? Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm saying is like, wait a minute, is there no lawyer next to him? You know, is, he's on camera. Don't answer this. No, 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 no. He didn't do him. anything like that because he's, you know, he's, he has the greatest amounts of chutzpah like that I've seen in, 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 I don't know, maybe, you know, I've interviewed maybe a hundred people for do documentaries over the year. I've never met anybody who is simply as shameless as, as, as Roy. So to answer your question from the beginning, we were like, the very first thing we did was we interviewed him for three solid 10 hour days, but like 25 to 30 hours of interview footage. We got every single story from him because we were like, look, <laughs> this, this man is a natural born storyteller. And we didn't realize, you know, when we started the story, we thought it was going to be largely funny or largely li not funny, but uh, like lightweight, charming. We're like, all right, here's, here's a here's that great Internet meme, girl bossing too close to the sun. You know, like sort of he's, he was he was trying too hard and then he got burnt by by his own success. So we thought, all right, well, we'll let him we'll see what he says. And then we'll kind of base off of that. And he told every single story. From the what you know that you see in the film, basically. But he told all of them from constantly different view from sorry, he told all of them in constantly different tones. He would tell a story as a joke. He would tell the story then as a uh, as a caper, like an adventure story. Then he would tell it like a tragedy. But Roy was always the hero <laughs> of each story. And it was always thanks to him, like to feed the kids because he didn't have enough feed. He would call up um, supermarkets and order 30 roast chickens uh, the night before. And then he wouldn't go until like 30 minutes before they were closing so that uh, they marked them down. You know, he was always full of these things. And then we realized, all right, after that, well, kids, we talked to the kids, we're like, what was the food like? And they're like, regularly, there wasn't any, and they've been promised it. And we're like, so it evolved along the way. We didn't realize the scale of malfeasance that um, that Roy, you know, and, and, the, and Bishop Sycamore um, were constantly doing until we got into it. And that really, so the film, the film had in the, the edit, the film changed wildly like three or four times. And then there's obviously the school at ESPN, you know, like how much did you get any pushback from them? You know, you had to get their angles. Like, wait a minute, did you guys not check these out for ESPN? Did you not, you know, as, as the game was playing on ESPN and these guys are like, well, we don't know who's number 54. We don't know who's the quarterback. How, how is it that no one has, a, a schedule of who the players are, you know, how did they even get this possible? And then they, you know, the, the fact that, you know, a uh, school and, you know, this, everybody's involved, you know, like you say, like Ohio, like they have no trainer, you know, it's like, aren't, aren't these like check marks before a game is played, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the, one of the craziest parts about it is this whole situation reveals the like glaring gaps in the process of playing high school sports at, at a certain level where there's so many things people just don't do, don't check, don't follow up on. And, you know, ESPN, they didn't want to talk to us. They didn't want to let anyone from ESPN talk to us who was involved. Um, we were, I yeah. thought it would have been a good Have they run their own piece on this? I'm just curious. Have they run their own? I, I can only imagine this is, would be a 30 for 30 piece on that they would do. Now they, I think they want to, they want to stay away from the story because of the, the it's lack of, yeah, it's embarrassing. The lack of, of, of due diligence they did in the process and also exposing the process by which they schedule these games and how little involvement they actually have in it, I think was why they probably weren't excited to talk to us or let anyone, even the announcers talk to us. So, um, yeah, we didn't get pretty much anything from them at all. Because uh -huh. yeah, we really wanted to talk to the announcers because they basically, if they hadn't called what they saw as honestly as they saw it, I don't think this story would have blown up, right? And something somebody said, I think Bomani uh, Jones said it really well, which is like, do you realize how incompetent an event has to be so that the people who are paid by the organizers to announce the event are telling you this is one of the most shockingly organized things I've ever seen. He's like, the fact that they couldn't stop themselves <laughs> on the payroll from talking about what a disgrace this thing was shows you how bad it was. So we were desperate to talk to them because 
you know, they effectively started a firestorm on the internet and helped uh, bring light to this sort of, not just so, more. Yeah. So social media obviously played, paved the way for this thing to get started. Like, I'm sure there's other stories that come out of there, but I'm sure you never know if there, if there had been stories like this in the past, but because you don't have social media for people to talk about it live, you don't know these things. You know, it's like, you, you know, especially when it's coming from, uh, uh, you know, small towns. If it wasn't played on ESPN, nobody would pay attention, you know, because it's, you know, they're playing the number one school. Right. Friday Night Lights. <laughs> um, right. But it, it, at the end of the day, how about the, you know, when you're talking to the students, you know, um, there's the quarterback, which is a good get, you know, um, you know, there's the success stories, not so much success. You know, but telling you know their perspective. Were there, were any, was there any student out there that was reluctant to get on camera? Some of the ones we talked to, we had to like convince. I mean, the if we had taken the no's for an answer the first time around, you probably wouldn't have had many players in there at all. Um, but there were <clears throat> there were people who we had to really like express to them how important it was for the story, for what had happened, for them to tell, you know, their experience and to let them know, like, look, this is probably the biggest platform you're going to get to talk about your experience on HBO, right? Like, like at any point when this comes up in any, any way, like, you probably aren't going to have this opportunity to do it. And so that opened a lot of people up to wanting to be a part of telling this, telling their story. And then knowing like they weren't going to be alone in it, like that there were other people who shared their experience who were also a part of, you know, talking about what happened. And, and so, you know, a lot of the, they talk to Roy, Roy reaches out to them pretty regularly. And I think that was part of their apprehension as well, which is knowing that Roy, you know, is constantly in contact with them or trying to tell them, you know, what to say or how to feel about, what happened and so a little there was a I think there was a little bit of fear there in that regard um but eventually the people that we got the players that we got were the ones who had some of the most compelling uh things to say that we actually you know believed because we were hearing the same thing from multiple people who did not know we were talking to other people with the same story and so there was no way for them to like get together and come up with the same story we were talking to people separately, independently, even before we filmed them, uh, before we got them on camera in pre-interview, who were telling us all the same stories. And mm -hmm. so it just, it made it pretty obvious to us they were all telling the truth because some of them didn't even play on the same team. They were, they were different years of Bishop Sycamore where they were all telling us the same things that happened. Now, does Roy come across as a father figure, which is why some people still, you know, like him and still talk to him? Or is he just a good salesman? You know, he he is an incredible salesman. He's an incredible salesman. And he he used, it's one of the like most sinister parts of the whole thing is he used that father figure angle to lure these kids into this experience and to get them into, you know, giving up this portion of their lives that they can't get back in terms of their eligibility to play football or or do anything in that regard and so in a in a weird way it's yeah he he used the father figure uh uh mentality to to basically prey on these kids dreams and and these were like, kids who don't so like have, he's, the, he's the bill fagan <laughs> Yeah, I mean, these these are kids who most of them, their dads aren't around. And so when someone comes around and, and says, I'm going to like, I'm going to put you on my back and I'm going to take you to the place you want to go, you, those kids especially, like, believe it. And it's so heartbreaking to see how how it played out. I mean, you hear now, Philly say he doesn't trust men anymore. Like, you're like, that's... It's unfortunate. Isaiah saying he's never cried before. I mean, these things, this, these kids felt like their lives got wasted. You know, now before the game, was there, did you guys do any research to see if anybody, if any of the students had their suspicions of this before the ESPN game and it blew over? You know, did you find any kids out there or any parents out there that thought something's not right here? 
and then no one was even though nobody said anything yeah i mean the because i mean that was the fourth year of this school and as trayvon said before every kid that went through every year had the same stories and every year roy would use the same lies but on a new batch of people and i think you know one of the characters in the film that that you know is a real is one of the real characters in the film is this guy ben Faree, who's a local um he was a local government official in the sort of sports regulate regulatory body and every single year he would ring the alarm bells and say hey these guys are frauds this is bad this is unsafe this is unlicensed this is illegal and he actually has a story that's terrible which is that he went to one of the big local schools in columbus before and after all of this happened after the espn game he asked one of the big local high schools if they kept going would you play them and they said yeah we need games like it's it's there is so much pressure on these money machines you know there's so much pressure on on these schools that take such prestige and make such financial upside from having successful football teams and it's so hard for them to find games at the right level they just they just don't care um which is awful in the end you know we obviously people because they're hearing his story and obviously people will watch this and they will get his story and what he did to to game the system what you know and you know as the, as the movie ends obviously we don't you know we don't want to reveal too much of a spoiler because we want them to watch the route um what's the end goal that you think should be happen regarding teams that want to play you know like you know, where where does the checks and balances begin you know, when you're playing a school that obviously can rig a situation like this where you're thinking they're real, even if even though they need games, you know, where does the checks and balances begin? Can anyone answer that? I mean, yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, uh, the um, IMG Academy system just got acquired by Endeavor or WME, one of them, which is basically the same, it's kind of massive media company who represent us we love you wme but um they um they acquired them for like 1.3 billion i think mm-hmm. is 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 the thing this is high school this isn't college this is this is children this is legal children right who are generating enough revenue that a big vc back company thinks one school one in one school is worth 1.3 billion dollars right so you have this very top level and i I, img and w all these people they do everything by the book right i'm not accusing we're not accusing them of of anything we we, we didn't do any research into them but i'm sure they do everything fine but imagine the pressure that creates down the chain when you're that close to that kind of money success opportunity fame power whatever it is that you however you process that kind of status right and then what you have you have you know a second tier of schools that are trying to be like that and doing quite well and probably follow most of the laws most of the rules right and then what you have and bishop sycamore and roy johnson are by no means (laughs) alone or even rare then what you have is schools and fake schools and academies who are offering these kids this kind of money this kind of opportunity or pretending they are in order to get close to that heat, close to that status. Some of them, like Roy, don't even necessarily have a very good idea of how they're going to monetize this thing, right? They just know that if they can stay in the game long enough, if they ain't close enough to that heat, their lives can change. And they're not necessarily wrong, Um, but they don't follow any of the rules in their quest for that kind of money and power. And I think the Bishop Sycamores, just one last time, what the Bishop Sycamore scandal shows more clearly than anything is that the system has no checks and balances it doesn't have any you claim to be a high school you can be a high school you can play these things and then you have you know people four years too old playing football against you know people in their early teens and with no medical support with no financial housing with no food supplied and um the scale of this is new and something has to be done about it Where's what's going on Roy now? Like what how's where's his life now at this point? You know, is he being t- paid to talk left and right? You know, is, is he telling his story out there or, or did he give it to you exclusively? Hey, yeah, we 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 um 
one of our executive producers on the film is Michael Strahan and Michael reached out to Roy um, early on that's how we kind of how we got him to talk and as we said to Roy when we first started doing this we weren't there to hang him you know we weren't we didn't go into this thing expecting to find what we found you know um we don't really believe that Roy has any shame. We don't really believe that Roy feels bad. Clearly not when you watch him. You know, you're just fascinated by, like I said, the hubris of like, yeah. he's happy to be on camera and just like, you know, he's a, he's been told nothing's going to happen to you. Just, you know, it's a double jeopardy or whatever. It's like, you're good to go. Just spill it all out. You know, it's like he wanted to tell his story, you know. Um, yeah. Moving forward, you know, you guys are, you know, doing a lot of stuff. You know, have you been getting a lot of projects that people want you to do? Like, how, what's the process of how the work that you guys go after? You take that one, Trey. Um, I mean, it's for us, it's less about <clears throat> genre or format and all about the story or like how interested we are in telling that story because everything you take on is going to cost you up to a year or two of your life in time of you know, creating it and doing, trying to do a good job of it. And so um, when it comes to any of our film and TV projects or, or doc projects, it's always how interested we are in telling that story and how important we feel, uh, you know, those stories are. And can we service it? Like, can we make what we would think is uh, the best version of this particular thing? And so um we get offered a lot of things in the vein of things we've already you know done or things that just kind of match up with um our resumes and that's kind of how we pick it it's like you know when this story came it was one of those stories where you're like it's so so interesting and so uh connected to the american experience where there's so many dynamics to it there's so many elements to it that go into um, extrapolating the American dream. Like, how do you pursue something like that? And so, and from an angle like a black Midwestern uh, Republican football, high school football coach, right? Um, that to me was just a fascinating lens to look at the world through, to look at life through. And so when, when we get offered things or we get pitched things, that's kind of our approach is, you know, what, what is this? Do we want to see this in the world told through our point of view or through our lens? And so, um, yeah, that's kind of how we how we approach things. This is done. It's going to air on HBO. It's going to play at the festival. You know, is there anything you guys are working on now or is it still wait and see? Yeah, I mean, we 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 still have razor blade tears. Uh, the S.A. Cosby novel we adapted for Paramount with Jerry Bruckheimer that is um, um, coming whenever the uh, writer's strike uh, works itself out. And um, we have some we have a, uh, some other movie projects that are at various places that are in that same holding pattern because of the writer's strike. Um, but this was... BS High was the 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 next thing to to be released, the closest thing to coming out into the world that you know was not affected by anything in that nature. So yeah, when we we uh we have a lot of stuff in development that um you know assuming this resolves itself quick enough, we can get back to work on it. That we're excited for people to see and hear about. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to speak with you guys. Obviously, uh, you know, as I watched this, you know, like I said, Roy's a character. It wasn't like, you know, he was reluctant. You just kind of were fascinated, like, okay, you know, um, you want to work with him, but you don't, you know? He's the <laughs> ultimate salesman, but, you know, you gotta, you can't trust him all the way, you know? Make sure the dots and T's are crossed, you know? <laughs> so, uh, good luck at the premiere. Is Roy, is, it, is he expected to make an appearance? Or is it just gonna be you guys? We, we we did not invite Roy um, because, we, <laughs> because we invited the kids and we want that we want the kids to be the focus of the yeah. thing. But Roy is coming. In fact, in one minute I'll be talking to Roy and uh, trying to ex explain that we don't want tomorrow to be about him, which <laughs> is unlikely. <laughs> That's the luck with everything else. Thank Obviously, you. congrats on everything you guys have been doing and have done so far. We will talk down the road in your next project. All Take right. care. Appreciate Thank you, Wilson. Thank you so much. Be well.